Okay, let's do adult respiratory distress syndrome, also called acute lung injury or adult respiratory distress syndrome. And what is it exactly? Really, it's a form of pulmonary edema. Normally, we think of pulmonary edema as, okay, caused by left heart failure, so the blood going to the left heart meets that resistance, and then a hydrostatic pressure pushes fluid back into the alveoli, and bam, you have pulmonary edema and pairing gas exchange. Well, kind of the same underlying problem, except even more severe and serious. What happens in ARDS is that there is either a direct lung injury that affects the inside of the lung affects the alveoli directly, things like smoke inhalation, and this is, I made that as an example. Near drowning, aspiration could really damage those alveoli because the hydrochloric acid is so um, harsh on our tissues in our, in our airway. Or indirectly through the blood supply. Toxins in our blood supply, a snake bite could be an underlying reason. Ischemia is a huge underlying reason. Sepsis has toxins and it causes ischemia. So that's a huge underlying reason for ARDS to occur. So what happens? What happens is that an, an inflammatory response occurs as a result of either this direct or indirect injury. An inflammatory response changes the capillary permeability, changes the permeability of, of the alveoli as well. And as opposed to normal alveoli, where you have O2 exchange for CO2, perfect diffusion of gases, what you have is the inability of the alveoli to then diffuse gases across that membrane. And the fluid in the alveoli also blocks surfactant secretion and dilutes the little bit of surfactant that's still there. So you have a hypoxemia that's getting worse and worse. So initially, the patient's response to hypoxemia is to breathe rapid and try to correct it by increasing the radiant depth of ventilation. And then what do we get when patients breathe more deeply and ventilate more quickly? Is a respiratory alkalosis. So now initially, in the early phases, we have respiratory alkalosis with hypoxemia. So as the patient gets more and more hypoxemic, something called shunting occurs. And shunting is really, you know, literally that term means things are bypassed. Well, in this context, it means that the blood flow is going from the right side of the circulation to the left without participating in gas exchange. So that venous blood coming from the pulmonary artery and trying to go over to the pulmonary vein is almost unchanged in places in terms of its oxygenation. So that is called shunting. It's called refractory hypoxemia when it doesn't matter how much fraction of inspired oxygen concentration or how high you go with that oxygen, it doesn't improve the PaO2 levels. So you're refractory to it means you're not responding to it. So that's one of the conditions in ARDS. So what do we do about the refractory hypoxemia? Well, we talked about this ventilator maneuver in the ventilator um, series we add PEEP, or positive end expiratory pressure. So what PEEP does is it leaves pressure in the alveoli at end exhalation. So this is good, right? More time for gases to diffuse, more surface area for gases to diffuse. You're able to improve the PaO2 without even worrying about increasing that FiO2. Well, as we're getting more and more severe in our condition with ARDS, we require more and more PEEP to try to improve our PaO2. So PEEP is a great thing because it will allow for more surface area, but eventually when we go up to 10 centimeters of water pressure, 15 centimeters of water pressure, what you're doing is increasing the pressure, intrathoracic pressure, you're actually applying pressure to the structures of the mediastinum, you're applying pressure to the heart, you're compressing cardiac output. Now, now where are we? Now we're compromising venous return. We're impairing cardiac output, and we're right back where we started again, having less oxygen available to the tissues because of that compromised blood flow. So PEEP has to be titrated real carefully in ARDS, even though we're fighting to maintain that PaO2 level that's minimally going to perfuse the tissues.
Because the thing is, with art, something happens eventually as the inflammatory response gets, um, covers more and more surface area of the alveoli, it's then replaced with fibrin scar tissue. Because that's what happens after inflammation. The tissues then decide, well, I'll fix it, don't worry. But it's definitely counterproductive in the alveoli because scar tissue is not a viable alveoli tissue that allows for diffusion of gases that allows for expansion with ventilation. So what you get is the inability of the alveoli to expand, and that's called poor compliance. So we have decreasing compliance and a ventilation where it's really difficult to even apply positive pressure to that airway. So this is a good opportunity to look at what we call pressure cycle ventilation, which we talked about a little bit in our um, in our ventilator video, that's when the inspiratory phase ends, when that preset pressure is reached in the airway. So this way, even though we have decreased compliance, we're not going to overstretch the alveoli. We're not going to threaten barotrauma in our airway. So pressure cycle ventilation is one of the techniques, one of the maneuvers when the patient's, um, when the patient's alveoli gets that sick. Another assessment finding eventually that you'll see is, is white out on your chest x-ray because remember on x-rays, white means fluid. So as the, as the fluid you know, fills up the alveoli and that pulmonary edema gets more and more difficult to manage, the, the x-ray will reveal that. So this shows you how it doesn't even matter how much O2, 100% even, could go into the airway and the blood supply can go from the right side to the left barely participating in oxygen exchange. You see the fibrin scar tissue laid down, areas of the pulmonary edema, collapsed alveoli, and that is the challenge of the ARDS patient. Okay, so sedation and paralysis, other maneuvers. So, you know, you're probably familiar by now if you've been in the critical care units that it's pretty common practice. We need to sedate our patients on the ventilator. We need to keep them calm. We don't want them bucking the ventilator, breathing contrary to those positive pressure breaths. We don't want them uncomfortable. So we try to, you know, a little bit of fentanyl, a little bit of Versed, propofol as an anesthetic. And all these things are, are you know, going to make the patient more comfortable. But in the case of ARDS, where your PaO2 is at such a precarious, precarious level, it's also going to decrease the demands for oxygen. It's going to calm the patient down. So the metabolism is not as high. So it serves a very important uh, role, the sedation and even paralysis, which is even more aggressive. Because remember, the longer somebody does not use muscles, and in this case, most importantly, that diaphragm, that large muscle of ventilation, then the harder it's going to be to get back you know, into that habit of exercising it again so it's always used with caution and yet if you're not oxygenating perfusing your vital organs then you're not going to have a very good outcome so it's a very tricky balance fluids well you know we are in a pulmonary edema right now and although we need to attend to transport for you know good perfusion we also don't want to add insult to injury so to speak by adding fluids into the system, which could very well spill over into the alveoli and make oxygenation worse and make surfactant secretion even more difficult. Nutrition is very important for all patients on the ventilator and definitely patients with ARDS because without you know, the calories and the protein for good growth and repair of those muscles of ventilation in particular, you are not going to have a very good time trying to get off that ventilator. So we have to you know, think about atrophy of those muscles and we need to make sure they have sufficient protein in their diet and a low carbohydrate load because what's the byproduct of carbohydrates in our diet? The byproduct is CO2. So we don't want to add work to their breathing by giving them more, even, even more CO2 to blow off. Hemodynamic monitoring, remember that's not going to treat the patient but it is sure gonna provide precise measures of how well our interventions are working with these patients. So, you know, swan gans or that pulmonary artery catheter that we talked about will tell us exactly what that right atrium pressure is, will tell us exactly what the cardiac output is, and if you're lucky, will give us what's called the mixed venous 
oxygen saturation, which is not the saturation in the arterial blood, it's the saturation in the venous blood when it comes back from trying to perfuse the system. And in this case, it's so important because we wanna know just how insufficient our oxygen is. Because if that mixed venous comes back really, really low with normal being 60 to 80%, we know that the cardiac output is, is not sufficient enough to provide and the oxygenation that we're providing is insufficient. So that's another good barometer to use. The most sensitive indicator of internal organ perfusion, another mantra for you, is urine output. So make sure that perfusion is good, that blood flow is sufficient by constant monitoring of your urine, urine output because you are titrating fluids very precisely. Bye.